Good evening, all of you, and a very warm welcome to this uh, session here on ethics, spirituality at the end of life. I hope you're all having fun time going around, uh, visiting various places in this lovely, beautiful little city um, of Kirkwall and, of course, other places around and other um, islands. The Glasgow University End of Life Studies is very pleased um, to organize this event. My name is uh, Hamilton Inbadas, and I'm an ordained minister, originally coming from the Church of South India. I have been in Britain from uh, 2011. Currently, my role is as a research associate in the Glasgow End of Life Studies group. The major focus of our research is to look at how global communities, whether medical or local communities or religious communities, have responded to end-of-life issues. Um, so we are looking at international context, global context, how various communities have responded to um, the, um, globe, uh, the issues around end of life, and how, why, and uh, with what effect. This particular session, uh, ethics at the end of life, and ethics spirituality, and spirituality at the end of life, is going to be shared by two of us. Uh, myself, um, I'll be speaking for the first um, bit of the session, and then we have with us uh, Professor Robin Taylor uh, from the University of Edinburgh. He's, the, he's, uh, he's an academic respiratory physician um, uh, in the University of Glasgow, uh, sorry, with the, uh, the University of Edinburgh. No, 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 I got that. <laughs> I take that back and say it again, University of Edinburgh, um, but with uh, special interest in uh, end-of-life issues, and particularly um, on end of life issues uh, surrounding hospitals, uh, death at, at the hospital. Um, and he also teaches diagnosing death to medical students, and I think that's a very, very important um, uh, session all medical students should have, but unfortunately not a lot of them in many countries in the world get this, this session. Um, and other than the interest in end-of-life issues, there's another commonality between us, which is that we are both ordained ministers, um, of course, of different churches. So um, he'll be speaking after me, and then at the end we will have some time uh, for, for discussion um, on, on the topic. I hope you will enjoy uh, the session here, and uh, uh, I, I look forward to a good uh, discussion at the end. We are all at a science festival. And you might wonder what science may have to do with death, dying, and end of life. In general, you might associate science with all the scientific inventions that are behind the improved health we have. Very true. The improved health systems we have, indeed. And there's so many different possibilities the sci sciences have given us to the modern world that were not available decades ago, centuries ago. There was a time when people died because they just couldn't eat. Today, if that is the problem, the person can live longer without having to eat the way everyone else eats. The person can be given something to eat. The tummy is filled in different ways. There was a time when people died because they did not have the capacity to drink anymore. That's not the case anymore. If you cannot drink, you can still live. There was a time when people died if they couldn't breathe by themselves. Today, that's not the case. If you cannot breathe, we will make you live. All this and many, 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 many more things 
are made possible because of all the inventions of modern science. And by giving these examples, I'm already exposing the two sides of the scientific inventions that we have, the, sci the scientific advance, advancement that we have in healthcare. The two sides are very evident. On the one hand, there's this glorious side of the scientific advancement of medicine, which is that we do live healthier lives. And then there's this problematic area, which is we live longer lives. The longer is problematic because the longer doesn't necessarily guarantee healthy. And then there is this third section, which is that we live much longer and raising so many questions about actually should life be supported in this way, in such artificiality, in such grueling conditions, should life not end before this? So the connection that I try to make for this evening is that science, although has contributed very, very considerably to the advancement of healthcare, to health in general, it has left human community with questions, with a lot of questions. And the way we ask these questions and the way we respond to these questions vary considerably based on our own cultural context, and I'm thinking about the global community at the moment, different countries, different communities living in different parts of the world respond to these questions or even ask these questions differently. What is at the heart of these questions? For me, is spirituality. Now, I know some of your heads immediately go, what is spirituality then? How do you define spirituality? To be on a safe ground, I take a definition from somewhere. Um, this is a, um, a, a spirituality uh, academic group in George Washington University, headed by um, Professor Christina Puschelski, and they had a consultation where uh, experts from all over the world came around and tried to handle exactly the same question, what is spirituality? And, and this is their definition. Spirituality is that aspect of humanity that refers to the way individuals seek and express meaning and purpose to their lives, and the way they experience and express connectedness to themselves, to others, to the context in which they are situated, and to the sacred. As you see, this definition is quite a broad definition. I have one problem with this definition, which is, I mean, I, I like the idea of the definition because it covers the notion that it's about the way we find meaning for our lives. It also brings in the element of connectedness to myself, the way I see myself, the way I relate to the others, my family, my friends, and my wider circles, and also to the significant or the sacred. But what I don't like about this definition is that uh, this definition is very individual focused. The way an individual finds meaning, the way an individual finds connectedness. Well, it is not a problem per se, 
The problem is that often the way we find meaning, the way we find meaningful connections and connectedness is not something that we individually cultivate ourselves right from the scr scratch. We live in communities. There is a huge communal element to our understanding of spirituality, to our exposure to or to our structuring of our own spirituality. There's a huge communitarian element to this that is missing in this definition. Now, how does spirituality sit at the heart of the questions we ask about death, dying, and the end of life issues as we face them? I take you back to my chaplaincy days when I was a chaplain in, in an hospital in Velour in India, Christian Medical College in India. The palliative care team went to see this patient on a home visit. And we, when we got there, I was, um, I was the chaplain slash driver for the team. Uh, so when we got there, the patient was there lying on her own. The family had gone to various places to work and to school and to college. She was there in severe, severe, severe pain. We got there finding no one else but the patient, and we couldn't, we couldn't decide what to do. Anyway, we, we started talking to the patient. That's one thing we could do. But eventually, the news went to the husband who was working in the fields. He came. The question that we were faced with was whether it was right whether it was morally appropriate for this patient to be taken to a hospice which was opened. The family feels it is immoral for, for their side. It is not acceptable for them for this patient to be taken away because it is that family's responsibility. It is their moral duty to care for that patient. With all the limitations that we have, extremely poor circumstances, with having to work, even leaving the one they are caring for alone at home, they still had to, they still believed very strongly that it is their responsibility, it is their moral duty to care for this mother, this wife. Thank you very much for the question, and I'm sure there's, there are many more questions, um, and I, I would be very grateful if we can um, hold them until the end. I know it's sometimes hard to, but it'll be uh, so that we can all sort of mutually contribute uh, to the discussion. Now, I gave you that example of that dilemma for that family. Um, and I'm aware very well that there are so many other questions, the same one possibly, and similar other questions that are around here in, in the Western context, in Scotland. Now, the, the, the spiritual cultural context forms therefore the, the, the basis on which we ask and face these questions. But there are many situations in today's world where such crucial elements are ignored or overlooked. There is much more emphasis on getting the body right, fixing the body, much less on facing these questions, questions that are founded on our spiritual values. I'll give you another example and I close. My wife, who's another ordained minister, worked recently 
in a multi-specialty hospital in Scotland as a chaplain. Palliative care team has been seeing this patient for a very long time. She's been in this hospital bed for a very, very long time. With the fact that the patient was not talking at all to anyone, there was very little communication between her and the limited family she had and the treating team. She was just not talking. She couldn't talk, she was unable to talk. It was not that she didn't want to talk, she couldn't talk. My wife got involved in, in her care. Grace comes with a lot of experience as a palliative care chaplain in India, just like me. And she found out from a relative that she loved a particular poet, a Scottish poet. So Grace, without having the opportunity to confirm with the patient, because she doesn't talk, whether she liked the idea of listening to those poems, on every visit, she started reading that, those, that, that poet's poems to her, not even knowing whether she's actually listening or not. Over a few weeks, she started talking. They were able to engage in a lengthy, deep conversations, something that was unimaginable a few weeks before, but now that conversation has formed everything that exposed to the team what is meaning and purpose for her, what is the central connection that gives life to her, how she wants to ask and answer questions about her own end of life. The question that I would like to ask is that, isn't there so much more emphasis on fixing the body, getting things right for the body, and much less emphasis on the basis from which where we ask questions about our end of life issues. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, as I've been introduced, my name is Robin Taylor. I am Scottish but I spent 35 years of my life overseas, 25 in New Zealand, and I returned to this country three years ago. My background is that I'm a respiratory physician, as Hamilton has said. Um, I got into asthma research. Uh, I had a research department. I had um, all the uh, scientific credentials you could wish, to be honest. But in 2010, I went into my ward in Dunedin Hospital in New Zealand and spent an hour with a family whose husband, whose father was dying of COPD, of emphysema. And we decided that um, realistically, this gentleman was at the end of life. I spent time setting up for some morphine to be given, some sedative, some oxygen. He was given a quiet single room and I had what I considered to be a very good end-of-life conversation. They were a lovely family. I went off duty at you know, 6 p.m. I came back in the next morning at 8 o'clock, and the charge nurse signaled to me to come into a room, and she said, you need to go down to the patient lounge down there because there's one angry family ready to eat you. So I went down to the patient lounge, and David, David Johnson had died at 6 a.m. And they had lingered long enough to express their fury and disgust at all that had happened in our ward that night. At 2 o'clock, he'd become more restless. The night nurse called the registrar. And in the way the system works, I had 14 registrars who would cover my unit in any one seven-day interval. 
So I knew him. In fact, he was the gold medal winner three years previously in the medical school in New Zealand. And he stuck a needle into the patient's artery three times, and he put up an, inf an, inf an intravenous infusion of a drug meant to relieve a spasm in asthmatics. And he put the patient on a non-invasive ventilator with a mask and a tubing and a pump. And I don't know if you can imagine, well, you can imagine. It doesn't take a lot of imagination. If I start talking to you like this, there's not much communication takes place. If I start speaking to you like this, there's not much communication. So this man is in the last hours of life and cannot communicate. And they said to me, what the Dickens, the words were more cruel than that, what the Dickens were you doing? You're responsible for this, the way, the, the way this man was treated during the night. You, you, you promised us he would have a dignified death. So we conducted an inquiry. And the problem was not the registrar or the nurse. The problem was the way the system dictated their behaviors. And so I was lurched into this. I got my team together. I said, that is ne I vow, we vow that is never going to happen in this ward again. It was so awful. I was traumatized by that interaction. They were a lovely family. They weren't a narky, nitpicky, blame casting family, all they had experienced was a bad death. And so in New Zealand for a year and a half, and now in Lanarkshire, where I'm working half time, and a little bit in Edinburgh, I've really abandoned asthma research and taken up this theme. Because bad deaths occur in our situation in hospitals. Um, I, be I believe in every hospital. Uh, I'm hesitant to say, because you have a small hospital half a mile from here but bad deaths occur because of the way the system functions. Now, on that night, that, uh, that young registrar, 27 years of age, out to, you know, cure everybody, he followed the, cr the protocols for intervention to the letter. You could never have faulted him. And so what emerged is that we have developed a system within healthcare which says that to uphold high standards of professional behavior is going to deliver good outcomes. But the maintenance of high standards meant that the values were eclipsed. And I suggest to you, and I have espoused these, the values that are at end of life that are more important than standards are compassion and common sense. That's what you would want, that's what I would want, even although the protocol, the guideline may be pushed aside just for a moment or two. And I want to commend Catherine Calderwood, the new Chief Medical Officer of uh, Scotland. She has recently published a report called Realistic Medicine, in which she is trying to advance exactly the theme that I've, I've just um, articulated. Compassion and common sense, realistic medicine. And Hamilton has alluded to that. Now, when I go on a ward round with 27, 29-year-old trainee postgraduate trainees, they and I, and I have changed, as I've admitted, have married, I have been married for the last 50 years to the model of curative medicine. And that has a scientific basis. Hence, I'm nesting that comment within the context of this, um, of this festival, because I think what we're picking up is science gone beyond its limits. And although we still, we undoubtedly have an elaborate set of ethical behaviors and standards to which we, 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 try, we try to adhere, they are in many places, they're in conflict. Science, in the form of medical technology, has overstretched itself. And that's what happened in that night in my ward in New Zealand. And I have committed myself, sometimes with a great opposition, to trying to change that. Now, in terms of the ethics of this, this conversation this evening, I want to deal with two things. One is futility, and one is truthfulness. But the issue of futility, i.e. interventions that do, are not going to achieve any good outcomes, and the issue of truthfulness are submerged under what I will describe as the death taboo in Western culture. And here's where the issue of spirituality comes in. Because to, in a secular environment, 
we have privatized, individualized the things of the soul such that they no longer matter in the delivery of healthcare in acute medical wards. Now you say, well, we're in a multicultural society. There's all sorts of values. There's all sorts of variability, variations on that theme. So we can't possibly deal with that in the NHS. But we have, we've gone too far. We can have respect for one another in terms of our, our spiritual values and still make them meaningful rather than out of respect, sweeping them into the background and making sure they don't intrude on the day-to-day -day workings of our medical wards. Why are we so latched on to futile treatments? Well, it's quite, it's complex. This is complex. I wish we had three and a half hours instead of just half an hour, but you'll be glad to know we will stick to half an hour. But he, let me quickly give you reasons why you and I indulge ourselves in the desire for futile treatments to keep going and going and going. One is our survival instinct, and it doesn't go when you're 70 or 72 or 74. It's still there. I want to survive. And we also project the survival instinct onto our mums and our dads. If you're 55, 58, and you have a mum or a dad who's 82 or 86 or 89, the survival instinct that you experience is projected onto your next of kin. You may say, well, that's a jolly good idea, it, 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 but um, it can get us into trouble. There's the death taboo, which is, I think, I was speaking to Hamilton just before, it's true for all human beings because death, since time immemorial, has threatened us. Why else, at least in the Christian setting, was the resurrection of Christ such a turning point in, in, in relieving some of the angst and anxiety? And that's part of our Christian heritage. There's scientific materialism, which Hamilton alluded to, is that I am, I am I'm two lungs, I'm a heart, I'm a liver, I'm a couple of kidneys, and I'm a brain. And if I find out the biology of the system, including P53, whether it's working or not, then I've dealt with the issue of death. But you see, all the skills that I bring when I go on a ward round, or a surgeon brings, or an ICU consultant brings, all these skills only postpone death. They do not extinguish it. And with that background, you see, we have this addiction to the curative medical model. It's an addiction on professionals' parts, but it's also an addiction in our community. Hence, you get Channel 4 running whole programs on which drugs at 50, 80, 100,000 pounds per annum is being advocated for a small number of people with a terminal event. And my, my question is not, should, my, should, should our efforts be engaged in, in saving life, my question is, if we can't save life, when are we going to get rid of what's called last chance medicine and give that person a good death rather than a desperate death, feeling that the system or everything round about them has let them down? And then there's even worse in my setting. I have to confess, I was, this, I was at the focal point of an ombudsman's inquiry. I've gone 37 years in the profession. I came back to Scotland and six months later, I got uh, involved in a case that was very upsetting, a bad death, and it went to the ombudsman. Now we have a blame culture out there, which is general, but when it comes to be focused on someone's death, it becomes a mechanism whereby somehow or other, our spirits, whether it's the family, or whether it's the professionals, or whether it's the community, we do something to ourselves which is profoundly negative in terms of this issue of I am mortal. Atul Gawande said that. So futile treatments should be identified. And I'm encouraging you, assuming that most of you are, are, are not in the profession, the healthcare professions, Try to discern when what interventions are being offered or considered will have no meaningful benefit. They'll be burdensome and have adverse effects. They, they will kindle an illusion of recovery. And they'll be wasteful of resources. 30% of resources in the American healthcare centre go to waste and have no meaningful outcome. When I go on a ward round and I meet a lady with severe respiratory failure who's come in and out of hospital four or five times, I say, Mary, you're, I see you're back in Ward 7. And she says, yes, doctor. I say, well, it's nice to see you again, sort of, but I'm sorry you're here. 
And she said, well, what, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, well, we're going to give you some antibiotics, we're going to give you some steroids, we'll give you oxygen for a couple of days, and we'll get you out by Friday afternoon. And she said, great, doctor. So we enter into complicitly engaging in something which is temporizing, but utterly, in the long run, futile. And I have conspired with that patient to cover over her mortality because chances are if she's an oxygen dependent patient, she has a one year survival rate of about you know, she's a one year survival rate of about twenty percent. So the futility issue is a key one. The second one, and I believe actually futile treatments for reasons that they can do more harm than good, should be declared unethical. The title of this talk was about the ethical issues that we face as we approach death. And the key one in our healthcare system is to be willing to identify what is not, when things get worse, what is going to do good and what is going to do harm. Curative interventions are more likely to do harm than good if the patient's on an end of life trajectory and that's irreversible. Palliative interventions, yes, we should be putting resources in that territory and the reason is that everybody faces death. And if the curative interventions only temporize, you still have to move to palliative intervention. The quality of the last six months or the last 12 months of that patient's life will have been enhanced if we think palliative sooner rather than later. When does a leaf die? Let's see what the audience thinks. When does a leaf die? Have me a, give me a go. Yes, somebody at the back. Thank you, Sue. That's correct. But is there an alternative answer? Any alternative answers? When it drops out of the tree? Yes, that's the alternative. Now, when I'm speaking to med students in Edinburgh, the majority say when it drops off the tree. But the truth is, we go out, you can't do it in Orkney terribly well. But, <laughs> <laughs> but when you go out, I was in Canada training for two years. The maple forests were fantastic. But in September, they're all green. And in December, there's not a leaf to be seen. So death is a, the dying process evolves. Now, when it happens to me and it happens to you, please God that we recognize that my leaves are changing color. If I went out to my garden, I actually do the gardening for our flatting complex in Edinburgh, but if I went out with a pot of green paint in October and I was seen to be painting leaves, <laughs> you would say, uh, are you all right? Now, if I do that in my ward round in an intensive care unit and I take out not a pot of paint but all the marvels of modern technology and do exactly the same thing, you would say, what a fine doctor he is. He's so energetic. He's working his butt off to help my mum. But I actually am doing a great deal of harm if I haven't discerned that all these efforts are futile. Now, the next stage comes, if that truth is a true truth, the next change come is sharing it. Truthfulness is something that is ethically, I believe, an imperative for all medical practitioners. But we don't do that. About 20% of patients do not wish to hear what's going on. You um, have a word with my daughter, I, doctor. I, that's their prerogative. That's autonomy. I don't. I really. It would. It would upset me. Remember that. People are upset with the truth, but it's temporary. The truth actually sets people free. And in healthcare, the truth is a commodity that, that ethically speaking, every man and woman whose life, who has experienced a life-threatening illness should have access to. Now, the truth involves this issue of prognosis. I do with a lot of patients with lung cancer. And invariably, I had a couple last week, and the couple, after the diagnosis, they slip out the door, and the husband turns and says to me, how long has she got, doctor? That was a serious question. And I said, I've honestly no idea. But the prognosis for a patient is not how long have I got, because you can very rarely answer that question accurately. That's in the public mind. But we need to shift that. The prognosis is an opinion based on medical assessment and judgment of the likely course of a medical condition. 
So if I develop Parkinson's disease, well, let's stick to my own territory, which is lung disease. If I develop interstitial lung disease, I can have quantitative prognosis when, when the clinician says to me, well, on average, from diagnosis to death is four years. But then that's quantitative. What I want to know is qualitative. I want to know that later down the track, I'm not going to be able to get up the stairs. I want to know that later on, I can have morphine that will help my breathlessness. I want to know these things and embrace them and simultaneously by doing so, accommodate the notion that I am a mortal being. Atul Gawande stated it in his Ruth lectures. Truth telling is an ethical responsibility and we must cultivate, we must reculture, I can't get the word, redevelop our culture such that it's not taboo to talk about your future because in this day and age, with long-term conditions, that's the way, that's the key. Hamilton and his wife are pastors. I was a pastor in New Zealand for 11 years, in parallel with being a doctor. If a chaplain goes to a bedside and says, how, Mary, and meets Mary again, and says, um, so Mary, how are you doing? Oh, doctor, I'm in here again. The doctor says he'll get me out on Friday, but I'm sure I'll be back in six weeks. What's the key question? You don't want a doctor sweeping in. You don't want me sweeping and say, Mary, you're not going to make it to Christmas. Mary, this is it. No. You want Mary to, you want, and here's where I go in my conversations, is to say, um, Mary, are you okay if we, if we chat about what's happening here and, and what might be happening to you in the future? And then you say to Mary, so what, how do you think things have been going for the last six months? Now, chances are, I haven't got a patient yet who has not contemplated in their private thoughts the evolution of their condition and where it's leading. The guts, yes, the guts that we need to have as families and as, and as practitioners is to say, Mary, so what are you thinking about your future? Oh, I just, I can't go on like this. Hospital four times in the last year. I can't get up the stairs. So Mary is given truthfulness. There's honesty. There's consent to contemplate mortality. And a consent to open up the way to good palliative care. Truth telling is the key. If you don't tell the truth, you can't change the future. You'll be addicted. You'll be locked in to all the behaviors that are designed to cure a patient rather than usher them towards the end of life. Now, in terms of spirituality, in terms of the soul, you get, Hamilton gave us a definition. I've never thought of a definition, but I do know that I am more than organs. And I do know that I think of my future not just in terms of the decay of my body, but my significance. And that's true, I think, of every man and woman if they're given the privilege of contemplating what lies ahead after this life. From the Christian standpoint, we were given as a foundation, a hope for the future. But even if there isn't a Christian element to someone's thinking, they need the permission to think. Families need permission to think. Bereavement is made better. If it doesn't start with a death certificate, but starts two weeks, two months, even two years before mom dies. You may say, oh, that's awfully morbid. It does not extinguish hope. Believe me, and this is not a, a, a Christian perspective. It's a palliative care literature perspective. Hope is not extinguished by, by, by truthfulness. So I'm going to close with these words. Um, Edith Cavell was a nurse who was executed by the Germans in 1915, 100 years ago. She was allegedly involved in espionage. She lay for 10 days in a cell before being executed. And she wrote these words. I have no fear nor shrinking. I have seen death so often that it is not strange or fearful to me. I thank God for these 10 weeks quiet, lying in a prison, before the end. Life has always been hurried. Life is full of difficulty. This time of rest has been a great mercy, standing as I do in view of God and eternity. Now, there is hurry, 
there is urgency, there's agitation, there's fretting, there's um, all these things go on in our hospitals. I think Edith Cavell would have been appalled as I was at what happened to David Johnson that night in my, because what we did as a team was we stood in the way of the quiet and the rest and the contemplation that I think all of us need and that feeds our spirituality. If we are surrounded by men and women, myself included, because I've done it for 37 years, who are, who, are, who are last chance grabbers, who are addicted to, to um, clinging on rather than letting go, and some families are like that just as much as the professionals, then we do each of us a disservice. I hope you have a good death. I hope I have a good death. Death is messy. Death is troublesome. Death is fearful. But it's not going to be solved by putting another 20 billions into the National Health Service. We need to do it differently. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes uh, for questions and discussion. Um, there's a roaming mic. Uh, my colleague Kate is uh, there with the mic. So uh, maybe <laughs> shall we have the first <laughs> question? Um, somewhere I see several hands here. OK, let's go here first. Kate, if you can come up here. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, what you have both said because I think this is so important and it brings us back to our humanity and our humanness. And I really believe that, like you, that death um, is part of life and um, that we need to be able to um, have a human death rather than a medical death. Mm -hmm. And um, so I would very much like to see um, advanced directives that are not just about the medical model, but are about what we as individuals want for ourselves in our last days or in the time leading up to our last days. And about us as people, and it helps those who are looking after us um, in hospital understand us more and appreciate us as people and what works for us as much as the as you know how important it is that that, that there is that uh, caring done by medical professionals but having that humanness mm -hmm. that I think is what's most important thank you um, I think um, thank you for the comment um, you know the the what matters to you is often um, you know embedded within the palliative care mantra, so to say. I mean, there's quite a lot of, you know, talking to the patient, finding out what matters to them is going on. But I think you're raising a very important point. It has to be part of the, the planning, advanced care planning, and, and those sort of things. Thank you. Um, like to Just to say, I'm not going to elaborate on it, but NHS Lanarkshire have commissioned me to do advanced care planning in the wards. Now, that... Advanced care planning is very com is actually complicated. It's it's a it's sort of a label for something that seems simple, but it's in the in the in the wards. There's a fluid situation in terms of the patient stability. Are they going to die? There's uncertainty, but there's also fluidity in their minds about what they actually are prepared to go for and whether it's wise or not. So I'm engaged in that. And if you want to, you're, I'm, I think in the interest of there are about nine hands. I think. I'd be delighted to speak more if you want to at the end of the session. Thank you. There are three words that I'd like to add or express that I haven't heard from you, but you've hinted at, and that is quality of life. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are individuals who, when they feel their quality of life is over, would like to just go. Well, quality of life only ends when I die. 
Um, you don't have quality of life. And I'm agreeing with you. You know I'm agreeing with you. But quality of life, we need to be careful. Quality of life doesn't mean that I can still play bowls, do the gardening, and all the Quality of life is actually a changing phenomenon. And I, that man who died in my ward had a poor quality of life for the last three hours of his life. So remember that quality of life applies at every stage. It's not like a, a step down from quality to no quality. Quality varies with the degree of ability, disability or illness that a patient's experiencing, but you can still enhance quality even towards the end of life. I, 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 I hear what you say, but I know there are people who believe that when, they, when, they, when what they feel uh -huh. is quality of life cut, they don't want to have it drawn out. They don't necessarily change their attitude towards what quality of life is. Yeah, I think this is where uh, the, the spiritual, uh, sorry, the community element com comes. I mean, as an individual, I decide what is quality for me. Um, is that achievable? Is that practical? Are we imagining something that is beyond, uh, you know, possibility? These are the bigger questions that we have. If we associate quality of life with things that I can do with my physical ability, then it leaves us with that question. I mean, because the, our physical ability will decline and stop. There's, there's no change with that. But if we can associate the, uh, the, the qual quality of my life with my own dignity as a person, again, not purely associated with what I can do and not, but because I am a living human being. So the intrinsic dignity that I have because I am a human being, there is more hope of understanding um, quality of life in a broader sense. I, I, I'm aware it's not a clear-cut answer, but I think there is enough to uh, take forward to think about. I saw another hand here. Yes, thank you. So, um, I'm going to raise the ugly question of finances and money. I actually, I hope when I'm dying that you're my doctor because that's what I want. But what I also know is that, not in Orkney, but in other places, yes. a GP has 10 minutes to talk to somebody. Mm -hmm. He may, he, she may well be the person I know best. The day that I go along and I'm able to actually discuss my death might be the day that he's just had 10 patients who've run over by five minutes and actually, I'm sorry, love, I haven't got time today. When, is, when are the politicians going to actually realise that we've got souls and hearts and we're not just, well, actually, you're in trouble because you had one patient extra died this year, not you had 20 patients died well this year? Well, I, I want to commend you for your perspective. When, in the evolution of things after that death in New Zealand, we scrapped our asthma clinic in favour of an end-of-life support clinic, which meant that the, the appointments went from 15 minutes to 45 minutes. And in, in New Zealand, which is profoundly influenced by Maori culture, in, in, you know, if you're having a conversation with Maori family, you have 12 in the room, you know. So you need 45 minutes. But, <laughs> but the point is, I'll bet there are very fewer, there are fewer people who clamour uh, at the doors of our health uh, ministers and politicians for that compared to um, the next that we've discovered th that, can that can affect the outcome of multiple sclerosis or, or uh, breast cancer. Um, we need the courage to change it and you need to be willing to lobby for it because um, things will bumble along just as they've done and these high ideals have to be, inst I hate to say this, but they have to be institutionalized within the system by changing the system. Otherwise, the system will never change. And that's what I've been up against. And it's really difficult to translate what you've just articulated into a practicals, practicalities on the ground. But uh, may I encourage you, lobby for it. Say, we're not going to spend money on that. We're going to spend money on, on this aspect because it's for everyone. Um, you say, well, that's priorities. Yeah, that's a great, another ethical debate. But can I encourage you? Write to your MP. And, and if, you see, if you spot something happening on the local scene or the national scene, 
be articulate. Make uh, a change. Yes, um, I'll come to you in a minute, but first at the back. Thank you. Kate had and had a morning walk, so this is her opportunity. Thanks, first of all, for a very lucid exposition. I mean, in this audience, I suspect you're singing to the choir. The average age is not particularly young, and the fact that people come along here um, shows they already have an interest. Mm. And I think you've articulated, certainly, many things that resonate with me. You kind of touched on the fact there's really a wide societal issue here. Mm -hmm. Hope, you know, um, survival instinct, whatever you like, is a very strong emotion. And I think we all observe this in people who we know who are in terminal phase of life. So I suppose my question is, it's fine talking to this audience. Realistically, how do you think society as a whole can be moved? Do you want to say that first, and then I'll take it? Or... Sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll ponder that. Just <laughs> well, um, in the in the past uh, few decades, the palliative care community won't be a surprise to you has thought about this seriously because often a number of questions that that are raised at the very end, uh, palliative commu community palliative care community believes that are better asked much earlier. So um, this is. Uh, thought and conversation about how do we get communities, get talking about engaging with the whole issue of death, end of life issues, um, and the like. And they have come up with some ideas. For example, uh, there's this whole notion of compassionate communities, and the, the idea of compassionate community uh, being a, a frame within which end of life issues can be discussed end-of-life issues can be addressed, end-of-life issues can be, uh, when people with end-of-life needs are there, they can be supported. And in fact, at seven o'clock in the same room, we meet again for another discussion on looking at specifically that uh, uh, compassionate communities. So please come. Um, now, the point that I was trying to say is there are thought processes, there are initiatives to engage schools, um, local communities to get talking about this. Um, you're absolutely right. But how do we do that? Uh, is it just uh, for the palliative care um, folk that are already busy taking care of people to initiate these conversations? What's the, what is the responsibility of the common people, the, 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 the societies themselves, to raise up to the occasion? Um, I'm very happy to, to be with the choir um, because with respect, you're the folks who are going to be in my ward, you know, within the next year, two, five years, um, not the 32-year-olds. And therefore, I think the changes have to take place in this cohort, the baby boomers, because it's our addiction that has driven the system to be what it is. And therefore, I go back to the lady who talked about anticipated care planning. That's a complex issue, but make up your mind for yourself and share it with your family so that it's not just a private notion, but actually has power. When you go into hospital with an acute crisis against a background of a year or two years of declining health, it's very difficult to exercise the so-called issue of autonomy. It's a theoretical consideration, but it's actually a moment of extreme powerlessness. Now, the idea that a doctor in a, and they're no longer in white coats, exercises power and paternalism and so on and crushes your desire to have delivered the type of care that you really want. That idea is mercifully going and shifting. But it'll only shift in the right direction if, the, the, if you as a person who is experiencing declining health has made up your mind that mortality is coming and that you have shaped some concept of how you're going to respond to a crisis before it happens. Now that's a, not anticipatory plan, but it is anticipatory thinking. And unless you do that, then I have to operate as a, a clinician, and I'm not there at two o'clock in the morning, thank goodness, I'm too old for that. But um, you'll get young doctors who respond according to the rule book. And the rule book can only change in about 20 or 25 years. I'm trying it. But in the meantime, please think about it and express these thoughts meaningfully. 
have your son or your daughter who's with you at the, going in in the ambulance to the emergency department own these thoughts before you get into the ambulance. Right. We have two more minutes uh, at the very back, please. Thank you. I come from three generations of medics, and this was a, a topic that often came up just amongst us as a family. And what fascinated me was that um, medical training all through the generations mm -hmm. never seemed to have addressed dying. Everybody had come to it just like you did, you know, moments of clarity, eureka moments, when you suddenly see that medicine has not fitted you for this particular point. And I wonder to myself, I wonder, I'd like to ask you, you say that we as the general public should know what we want and try and be powerful enough to um, ask for it at the last moment. But are young medics these days trained to recognise or, or to, to be able to take dying as part of the continuum? I mean, I remember when I was working on AIDS, one of the, most, one of the things that um, burnt out a lot of people was the fact that they were working with a a, a terminal illness, yes. and they were not able to be curative medics. Um, and I wonder if the problem doesn't lie right back at where doctors are trained. They're trained to cure. The paradigm is curing, not... Thank you. Uh, Robin, you know this better. Uh, you have one minute. One minute. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not... I just, I wasn't encouraging people to know what they're going to choose to do when they come into hospital. It's about having a mindset which is reconciled to the fact that they may not survive and you're not going to cling on at all costs. As for med, med students, I do once a month, half a day, role play. I teach them how to diagnose dying. What are the processes? I, am, I, I along with a few others, are trying to get this to change, but I'll, I think I'll be dead and gone myself by the time it's, it, but it's woven into the fabric of how doctors behave, but they need encouragement from the general public and from the politicians. This is about a community issue. Thank you very much. <laughs> Was that one minute? Yeah. Less than one minute. Excellent. Um, we close now. Thank you very much for your attention and contribution. That was very rich. Um, we are happy to have you know conversations just after this. If you're uh, you're welcome to do that. But again, thank you very much and have an enjoyable evening. <laughs>